Uh, welcome. Glad to be here. It's uh, quite exciting. We have a lot of uh, representatives with a lot of very nice things to talk about, certainly. Uh, this is the battle. Of course, it's not a battle. They don't get it. Yeah. <laughs> but, and the crowd leaves. But we're definitely going to have a very good discussion about the local development tools for, Dru for Drupal. My name is Ricardo Mayo. I'm from Acquia. And then we have Randy Fay, we have Mark Casias. Uh, Alejandro, unfortunately, is sick today, but he asks to apologize himself. Then we have Engin. Engin? Yep. yep. And then we have Matthias and Michael Schmidt. Um, so, for the people that were uh, just came here now, we have um, an hashtag on Twitter, so you can actually make questions. Uh, by the middle of this uh, session, we will have a Q&A. So your questions, I will pick some questions from there. Of course, eventually not all questions will be able to to be answered, but we will have the time to uh, go for them. Uh, so yeah. Um, that's the Twitter slide, I forget that. And yeah, let's start with Randy. Randy, okay. you have two minutes to pitch. Yeah, two minutes. Actually, I want an extra two minutes. <laughs> we we only get two minutes, 30 seconds. <laughs> My name is Randy Bay. I'm the, I'm the maintainer of DDEV, which is one of these tools. But I want to first make the pitch for why you want a local dev tool. Because all of these tools will work for you. How many of you use one of these tools already? So maybe two thirds, three quarters. And there's another set of you that uh, are running MAMP on your Mac or WAMP or you're installing Apache, and you're running FPM on your machine, and that kind of thing. And uh, that is a valid approach. And I did it for years, and I loved it. I'm, a, I'm one of those, you know, I'm one of those DevOps guys. I love, you know, tweaking it and putting the right thing and making it. But the reality of managing your own environment instead of using one of these tools is that you're going to spend your life either fixing your environment or fixing that junior dev over there, fixing her environment, right, or his environment. You're going to you're going to have that problem for the rest of your life, and your team is going to spend more time working on your environment than they're going to spend working on what you're supposed to be working on. And I think all of these tools are aiming to get you set up in a place where you can predictively have people working on the development that they're supposed to be working on and not working on their environment. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I, I think it's really important that we start there. And it's really important to recognize that all of these tools are aiming to solve that one problem. And they all do it, you know, everybody's got, it, got their own strengths and that kind of thing. But, but it's super important. And I think all of the tools are Docker-based. Is that true? Yes. Everybody's, everybody's Docker based. So if you're not familiar with Docker, it's a way of basically running little Linux machines on your computer. And each of these tools wraps Docker in a slightly different way so that you can have a predictable environment. As you probably know, almost all server environments are Linux. And almost all of them are running Apache or Nginx and PHP, FPM. So in the world of these tools, you're running in a predictable container that is like your deployment environment, which is another big win. So it's much closer to your deployment environment. It's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with running your own. It's just got you know the problems that I talked about. <laughs> so let me talk about DDEV just a little bit. Um, how many of you are using DDEV or tried it? That, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for. Uh, Thanks for doing that. DDEV is a Docker Compose wrapper that is wrapped in Go language. And it works the same on Windows or Mac or Linux. It works exactly the same. The, uh, the amazing thing about Go as a language is that you can compile into a fat binary that just has everything in it. And it's astonishing. And so we just 
build all three binaries for different Linux and Mac and Windows all at the same time, and we have none of those problems that you typically have of what to support it with. They just run on each on each container. Um, so DDEV local is uh, I think it's really easy to get, easy to learn, easy to get that first startup ramp. It is a command line uh, tool, and we don't have a supported GUI for it. We wish we did, but you know you can only do so many things. Um, but DW Local is a command line tool. But you, if you haven't tried it, I hope you'll try it. You can install it with Homebrew if you're on the Mac or on Linux. There's a nice Windows installer. You can you can install it either with Chocolati or just download the Windows installer from the GitHub releases page. And it's a command line. You can go into a directory, just make a <coughs> jump, ddev config, and ddev start, and put an index.php in there, an index.html, and start it. It'll give you a link. You click it, and there you are. You're on it. So that. It's a pretty straightforward startup environment. Most people don't have much trouble. We have excellent community support. We have an amazing community and the Drupal Slack and the DDEV channel. Um, get lots of help there from lots of people, the whole community, and we're there. Support is a very high priority for us. We spend, we, we really want it to work from you and we learn from you and we, we want to help, but we also learn from everything that you run into. There's always things, right? Um, a normal project startup, if you've already pulled the containers, is about 20 seconds on, on most environments. Um, you can run all kinds of different things. We, we have explicit support for Typo 3 and every variant of Drupal and Backdrop and everything else. Uh, got a different config for each. We are, we don't have as many, you know, like Doxel and Lando have great documentation about how to do the most amazingly complex services. Really excellent. Um, lots of good stuff. I'm not familiar with everything else, but some great documentation. But we have a whole, we have documentation for a number of services and almost every problem that everybody's tried to solve, they've been able to figure out how to solve it. And so we have, you know, extensibility documented, extensibility for solar and memcache, and just, uh, you know, dozens of other things. Lots of problems solved there. Um, we've been working on a regular maintenance schedule. We've been having a release every month or two. Um, when you need a feature, we've been trying to get it to you, you know? Can't always, but we, we have been doing that regularly. And we wish we had a GUI. Um, we probably will someday, but um, right now it's a command line, so that's a that's a disadvantage. So, all right, cool. Thanks. Thanks. Next is Mark Casillas. 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 Uh, I'm not going to stand because I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> okay. I actually am a software engineer for Media Current. I am not a part of the Lando team. Um, they. I was talking to one of their sports, uh, Mike, who's one of the main developers, about something, and he said, man, you're going to Amsterdam, here's a t-shirt, talk to people about Lando. Here I am. So, the thing about Lando, the thing about, uh, to Randy's point, is that uh, it's, as a, somebody who works in the, in a agency, you constantly have different configurations of where you're going to deliver your product. And the whole phrase, it works on my machine, does not work yeah, well. Yeah. Yep. in the agency live. So the thing about these, uh, you know, whether it's Vagrant or a, a, a Docker a solution, is then you have an environment that uh, emulates wherever you're going to deliver it to. And that's what makes these really good. <clears throat> Lando, the reason I uh, got involved with Lando, uh, I've been using it out of the box. Again, to Randy's point, no one wants to, or I am not one of those people that will want to configure my machine and reconfigure my machine. I want something that's a simple YAML file I can just fill out and go. And that's exactly what uh, Lando gave to me. Uh, real simple, out of the box, fires up a bunch of Docker containers, and I can actually um, run a, a Drupal in a, in a LAMP environment immediately. I can run it in a, uh, what's the one with, um, that Pantheon uses? Um, um, yeah, yeah. 
uh, just have that all running really quickly out of the box, and uh, I don't even have to mess with it. Uh, and again, it's a YAML configuration. Uh, they have a really great, uh, it, it is, there is not a GUI, but there is a great uh, command line interface where it asks you what type of service you want to use. Uh, do you want it to be PHP 7? Do you want it to be PHP 5, 6 still? Um, don't, you don't want that. Um, <laughs> but you can, you have those options. It's very, very easily configurable. And then once that goes through, you can simply um, make the adjustments. Say your solar is out of date and you want to update it on there. You just have to make the update on a YAML file instead of having to mess around with things. Uh, makes your life so much easier. Another thing that I really like, uh, I do enjoy using the Pantheon service and uh, Lando has a way that you can actually pull an entire site from Pantheon with a single line command. All you need is the, uh, the ID of the, the site and you have your, a full uh, Pantheon site straight up, no questions asked. You can pull down the database, do all the work, you have the, the exact same thing. Makes life easier on there. Uh, anything else? It, it actually works well with Drupal and WordPress and Node, although I only I really use Node locally. I don't really use Docker um, for that because it all compiles with NVM. You can have that uh, there. And uh, yeah, so it's great. I enjoy it and uh, hope you try it. But again, to Randy's point, using one of these tools, I don't. we're not going to fight because you're going to use something that's going to make your life easier, uh, not our lives easier. So have fun with that. Okay, thank, thanks, Mark. This is Engin. Yeah. Um, hello everyone, I'm Engin and I'm working as a developer at FFW. I'm here as a Doxal fan to re represent Doxal because none of the maintainers are here today. So I will first uh, start explaining what Doxal is. It's yeah, similar to the other tools but still. And then provide its benefits and its features in order to convince you. Uh, so Doxal is a tool uh, which uh, helps you to quick start a Docker powered uh, environment for development and uh, it guarantees basically consistent results for a project member. So it comes with a command line utility called fin and some configuration upon for Docker Compose and uh, the corresponding Docker image library like for PHP for several versions and Apache, MySQL, but also Solar, Elasticsearch, <laughs> Onish, and so on. Um, it provides you a way to set up a project with zero configuration, but at the same time, you can also, uh, it has also flexible configuration for advanced use cases. Uh, it <laughs> has uh, boilerplates for different projects or applications like Drupal, WordPress, Gatsby, WordPress, and uh, you can basically choose in uh, Wizards with Fin Project Rate what to um, set up there. It is a, from my point of view, good documented CI integration, uh, which works with well-known CI pipelines like Bitbucket, Circle CI, or Git, uh, GitLab pipe, uh, GitLab CI. Uh, which you can use in order to have branch or environment per branch or um, also persistent environments like a development environment or a UAT environment where you can do QA for example or um, UAT for your clients or demos for your clients. It has also web ID built in. Currently it's cloud 9 but with the next release it will be I think Visual Studio Server uh, with Xdebug uh, integrated. So basically, Doxel is there to remove the <coughs> headache of onboarding developers onto a project. They will be able to set up their local environment within minutes instead of hours or days, like uh, uh, every other uh, <laughs> project here. And no matter what launch stack you are using, is it Windows, Linux, uh, Mac, or local CI, it is there to have consistent results, basically. It is open source and free. It is developed by and uh, supported also by large Drupal shops and a uh, big, vibrant community. So next is Matthias. Launchpad. 
Hello, uh, I'm Matthias. Um, I'm from a Belgian company, Drop Solids, um, and I'm here to represent uh, Launchpad. Uh, Launchpad is actually a tool we started as a pet project, and we start to use it to also improve the onboarding time of people because it's really hard, actually, to say that Randy said to make some a local development stack working for everybody. So it started as a pet project to to make my own local environment working. Then it's Move to support, and now we're actually using it uh, to do our daily daily development. Um, it's it's actually based to to be fast and maintain. You don't need much maintenance to to make it work. So like other tools, you fill in the, the YAML form, or do you, and you can you get started. It also has a big advantage that it's completely integrated with our platform, and that's actually the biggest benefit. You just type the command to get a project, and in a couple of minutes you have to completely clones, database down, synced everything there. So currently it's only a tool we use internally, it's not yet open source, but it's actually a nice discussion to have here to, to see that we actually are all solving the same problem as <laughs> getting yeah, yeah. projects running <laughs> fast and on the local machines. So uh, yeah, the onboarding time dropped really, really. It's a, it's a huge improvement, like the hours or days are just so together with the uh, media or senior developer, Get locally running and you start all the projects without, without hassle and without to have uh, without to have to know the technical details of the project. Um, so it's it's fo it's, it's a developer focused. So it has all the necessary tools to do uh, debugging or profiling or, or like Ngrok support, Mailhawk, uh, uh, Xhaprof, everything that's needed there to really get into that to, to fix a problem is there. Uh, native support for um, Xdebugs on the CLI too because that's some. Sometimes hard for people to set up, so yeah, it has all the tools there to, to really get in depth to, to fix the problem. Um, and it's extendable per project, so yeah, it's configurable, have a YAML, YAML based. It's also in, in, uh, written in Go, so yeah, it's basically <laughs> it looks a lot like DDEV, but we have a different approach on some stuff, but yeah, it's kind of uh, similar uh, in the approach. So yeah. Everybody knows Michael. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'm here. Um, my name is Michael, and I'm here to represent Pygmy. Um, so Pygmy actually has an interesting story. Uh, it was literally built on a weekend by me, uh, because so we are a hosting company, and we do <laughs> Docker <laughs> development. Uh, we do Docker uh, container hosting, and we realized quite fast that um, the local environment or the local development system is not as great as we were hoping it is. So. A bit desperate, we just built something with some other tools. So Pygmy is really, that's like 300 lines of code. Um, but it basically uses a lot of other open source as possible. So we have an HA proxy, we have a mail hog, we have an SSH agent in there. But you just run it once and then you run Docker Compose. And Docker Compose has then some <laughs> environment variables that is read by Pygmy. Um, yeah, but I, we're actually. I said it was just built on a weekend, and my plan was to maybe maintain it for two months. Now it's three years, um, so we're continuing to maintain it, but we actually decided as Lagoon that we're going to support other tools. So we're starting to work uh, supporting with Lando first, and uh, because we really see that running our own tools, and especially for working with a lot of agencies, I mean, the amount of fighting about port 80 that I see on local computers <laughs> is uh, poor computers. And so, um, yeah, we said, okay, we will continue to have Pygmy. We're actually rebuilding it in Go right now because Ruby is not cool. And especially, like we heard before, running in a different environments, it's a bit hard. But um, the end goal is to actually say, like, we want to support all the main tools. So. I'm here to, to solve problems, but also to a bit understand, like, okay, where is the world going? Because I think last time we checked, there were 35 different local development tools. Wow. Um, so it's good to see now a bit less. <laughs> but I don't know. Like, it's just yeah, try another one. Make it 36. <laughs> <laughs> the ultimate tool that will solve all the problems. All the problems. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, that's me. So let's go to the questions. Uh, we got uh, a series of questions. Um, the first one, and I think it's directed to everyone here. So anyone that, that wants to start answering, go right ahead. So how do you tackle 
the performance issue <laughs> of Docker on OS X. <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> The Docker on Mac has a problem with uh, basically all of the, I think all of these tools take the strategy of mounting the, your project, your code, into the container, and then you get your web server running inside that mounted container. And uh, on OS X and to a certain extent on Windows as well. It's not as fast as we wish it was. So DDAP takes the approach of turning on caching first. So the Docker has explicit caching. Uh, and that actually works for a lot of people. A lot of people don't complain at that point. Um, but there are two other techniques, uh, one which we tried and failed at, and one which works pretty well. And most of pe most people are using DDAP with really big projects, like big Drupal 8 or Magento or Typo 3 projects, we are recommending that they use NFS. So you set up NFS on your Mac, and then Docker can mount the NFS into the container. And I would say it's five to 10 times faster. That might be an overstatement, I'm not sure. But um, you know, Magento, for example, without it, it's just way too big. And with it, uh, people are happy to work with Magento. So, so that's the, that's, oh, there's one other strategy that you've probably all heard of is the, is the cache syncing technique where um, there's, uh, there's a few different tools, classic tools, that will take two repositories and try to sync them, two-way sync. Um, and they work, and we had one. We had one. We still, we have. It's actually still in there, but it just broke. And you know, like the two-way caching is a really hard problem, and so we were unable to support that successfully. Anybody else want to talk to that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's it's really sad story. I feel like it's. Um, um, it's unfortunate that Docker does not decide to open source Docker for Mac, uh, which would allow all of us to actually solve the problems. Yeah. And instead, they're just keeping their issues and saying they're working on it, they're working on it. I don't know how many people are actually working at Docker for Docker for Mac. It's maybe okay. zero or one. Um, <laughs> so I think that's a really, really sad thing. And um, so one of the things that, that we are starting to do, and it's maybe a bit more the the advanced version is to actually not mount the whole Drupal repository into it, but to explicitly mount only the custom modules. So you mount module slash custom, theme slash custom, and all the core and all the mentor and all of that lives inside the Git repository. Uh, sorry, in the container. So it's only built inside the container because it's only the, the slowness only comes from when you mount volumes. Right. If you have volumes that are in the container natively inside the VM. Yes, Docker for Mac runs a VM. You don't see it, but it's a VM at the end. Um, then it's fast. So the problem is you end up then if you want to run xdebug, <coughs> then run that needs access to all your files. So it gets a bit more complicated as soon as you want to go into the debugging. But at least that has been for us a bit of solution for a couple of um, things. But yeah, it's, it would be really great if somebody solves the problem. There's a strategy like what Michael said um, that uh, people use on Typo 3. They have a bar directory, which is like Drupal's temp, um, which has no business being mounted in there. It's, it's throwaway. And so the solution to that, which works great, is to uh, mount on top of that a tempfs volume. In theirs, it's always in the like bars at the root. Uh, right. stuff, and so that's a that's a good technique. Anybody else want to speak to that? Uh, I was just I was just gonna say it's a great reason for me to go get a cup of coffee. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give the punchline or use Linux. Or use Linux. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, yeah. Can I just uh, make something? I haven't used this option. Oh, you you have to tweet your question, and then have, uh, we can we can get it. What? Is this an, another option for the, the questions? Yeah, you, you can have it on the phone on the end if, if you want, okay. or or then just tweet it. Okay. So uh, we have a tweeted question. The next question is, sorry, we have to have some kind of order here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, 
So the next question is actually a very positive and interesting one, and it comes from the audience here, and it's, it's saying, we are all doing the same thing in parallel. Why not collaborate more to actually build the best tool? <coughs> Who wants to go first? Yeah? I'll, I'll yeah? Okay. Sure. I mean, that, that's one of those things where uh, you have 26 competing standards in life. So let's write a, a 27th one. And now there are 27 competing standards in life. Uh, you, you, everybody's trying to do the same thing, but we're all taking different approaches. Uh, I think that the, the point is we're all trying to get to the same place, and eventually, you know, there's going to be one ring that rules them all, but we're not sure if we're there yet. Uh, we're hoping to, but eventually we're all trying to do things. Like, uh, some people are trying to ha have their tool for their specific platform. Uh, same with Lagoon, you know, people are trying to run it for, for, their, uh, for their specific things. Others are just trying to get, get kick the can further down and, and make things happen. So it's kind of hard to, for us all to like bring our heads together for one thing, because we all have certain different drives, I think would be a good way to say that. Anybody else? Yeah, I think that's true. And I, when I started working on, on, on Launchpad, that was my, my biggest struggle for will I invent something new or just start using something that already exists? But that's a, that's a point that's like a year and a half, two years ago. The speed issue wasn't fixed in any tool, like on, on OSX. So yeah, I started building something myself and then yeah, it, it worked. And then yeah, I think, I think it's good to have like multiple tools because every business model or every organization has its own way of solving things and the, the Specialities you have to add them to make your tool working for your organization is seen as overhead at that point. So yeah, I think it's, it's good to have and all together we can weigh in like on Docker, I guess, because yeah, or not. <laughs> and, and, uh, I don't know if, if Docker ever listened actually. I, I have the same issue. You, you can be in the issue queues there for years <laughs> and not have anybody from Docker respond. So yeah, but I think it's a good way to have multiple tools to, to look at it, to just be able to weigh in more and to, to find out the best solution for everything. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the reason that we are trying to get rid of Pygmy. It's exactly the, the I, I fully agree that it's super confusing why there are so many tools. I think we just have to understand that there was nothing at all out there before, or the only one was MAM, basically. And then, of course, a lot of people at the same time come up with trying to solve different solutions. and. I think it just will take time. Like with right now, we maybe are in the situation that there are a lot of tools, but if we may be talking two or three years, there's maybe only four or five. Um, and I think it's just a natural how things are happening. In um, But yes, if you are sitting here and thinking about, ooh, I should create another tool, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, come aboard to one of us if you're yes, going to do that. Yes, they're all open source. You can all, if you don't like something in there, just go and fix what you don't like and don't create your own tool. You're not going to make a lot of people happy if you don't do that. <laughs> so I do invite all of you to, I would love to collaborate. So we can change our direction to meet the needs of, of what other groups are doing. Uh, DDEV is really open to new, uh, to new paths and to explicit support, and we've added a lot of things in. Um, we have explicit TYPO3 support. Um, TYPO3 is another CMS very popular in Europe you might not be familiar with. TYPO3, very popular around here. TYPO3 found DDEV and they just went with it. So. And they just, it's in their docs. Nobody uses anything else. They just use DDEV. Um, and Drupal, the Drupal world's very different. Drupal is always building <laughs> this module and that module and all these other things to solve all these problems. And there's never, a you know, there, you can never imagine a decision like that being made in the Drupal world. But still, because Typo3 wanted that support, we were able to do what they wanted to do. And we could work together to meet the needs that all of these different tools are trying to meet. So there's possibilities there. OK, um, we're running late. Uh, but there are some other questions here that can be actually talked uh, about in the end, if we have uh, time. Uh, now we have two really important questions. They were tweeted long before the session. And one of, one of the, one of the these questions is this one. 
What are the most common difficulties found by users when using your tool? And I would like to go to which, each one of you, if possible. So what users find, find, find difficult using your tool, to your knowledge? Um, a lot of it has to go around, um, and again, you know, I am a user more than I am a developer of the tool, so uh, from this perspective, working with people at Media Current that use Lando, uh, they have a bit problem with the performance issue of Docker. Uh, the way they get into the NSF mounts and whatnot causes it to be a little bit slow for their liking. I honestly haven't seen that problem. Um, the training, we did a training at the beginning of, of DrupalCon uh, for component development, and we set everything up on Lando for it to work, um, and 90% of the people worked great out of the box. The couple of problems we had were people with Windows that had some weird Windows uh, Docker issues um, that I honestly couldn't solve, which was really frustrating. Uh, so there is a bit of a problem with Docker and Win or Lando and, and Windows. Um, it's getting better. With Hopefully that's actually one of the bugs that is preventing the full release of 3.0 of Lando, uh, which we'll get into in a minute. And uh, so those are probably, the, I would think, just a performance problem a, a bit. Also, if you have any custom configurations for ports and stuff like that, Lando does not expect that, so it kind of <laughs> freaks out on you. And, uh, fair, yeah. and, it, it, and it, it doesn't seem to work for some people. So uh, with VDEV, I think the, I, I think people who are used to working on the command line, they just get in there and it works. But people who aren't used to the command line, they just, you know, DDoS command line driven thing, and they look at it and they say, what's that big black thing? And what's why is it blinking at me? And we, that's why we wish, you know, that's why someday we'll have a GUI that simplifies that for people that are used to that. Um, but I think that's probably the biggest thing. Well, same for Coxo. I mean, uh, NOS people might get scared off if they need to start using CLI. So uh, that's one of the issues that there's like, uh, graphical uh, interface, and the other one is if you need to have advanced um, use cases, then you need to have a knowledge of Docker or Docker Compose, and that's also something uh, difficult, I would say, because we provide a way to easily start a local environment and get a stack running, and then they want to do something more, and then they need to get now Docker and Docker Compose. Yeah. Uh, the biggest issues we encountered was by when like a new release of Docker for Mac or something changed internally you have no knowledge of. And then suddenly it breaks or it has a performance penalty you you can't you didn't expect beforehand. And also that uh, if somebody wants to like you said override something, you, you need to have some like inner knowledge of a Docker Compose and that's some that's actually why the tool is there, to not have to have that knowledge. Some people are fine with just using a tool not knowing the internals, some people want to know the internals, so for the people who want to know it's no problem, they can figure it out the, themselves, but for the others it's sometimes hard to then just get that part in there that, that works. Then for the, the syncing issue, uh, like Randy said, there was previously no sync, sync, and at that point your, your sync just could get stuck without any notification. So you just was there and why is my change not going into my container? Why don't I do it? Why is my change not visible? Yeah, then that was very hard to explain to people why it broke down. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, for us it's actually interesting. It's a Windows support. Um, we do a lot of government right now. And um, yeah, they are stuck in Windows. And <laughs> stuck. <laughs> they're working with Windows. <laughs> exactly. And, but no, the, the, the problem they're stuck with is that they can actually not install all the tools they need. Yep. So Docker, again, they only support Windows 10 Pro or Enterprise. So many companies don't, or like in many times, they don't have that version installed. Cool. Or they don't have the permission to install yeah. it. And so that's actually really the hard part right now. It's, and, and so then they end up in like running, <coughs> I don't know, like MAMP again, or like other weird ways. And so that's that's a bit the challenging part. I don't think that anybody can actually solve that because again, it's a Docker problem. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we're looking at is just to go cloud IDE all the way. So to maybe offer a way that you don't need to run anything locally. 
like basically what you need is a browser um, where you can just go in and you can say which environment you want to edit and um, it opens up an IDE and when you edit it, it updates it on the server all the time. Like I was a big opponent against that for a long time because I want to have stuff running locally and but I see so many issues that this is like we're trying to convince people to give the users admin access and that's such such a big issue that we and it's not going to be the preferred way like as we still want to support it locally but yeah we just realized at the one point you, you need to find another way than local okay thanks very much um, so I, I would like to finish um, because we're almost out of time just giving you some uh, room to actually uh, talk about major plans and uh, a roadmap for your own tool. Um, how is that going? Uh, to stop. <laughs> yeah, the major plan. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, for us, the major plan is to support other tools. Okay. Pygmy is going to still exist. It's probably going to be in Go and because of portability. But um, if you want to use a really like if you also use other hosting part uh, platforms and stuff like that we want to we want to have possibilities to run lagoon images on other tools and i think that's our contribution that we can make to not create the 27th tool so that's going to be our roadmap i don't know how long it's going to take uh, if somebody's off the lando doxel or whatever tools wants to work and help and we can provide our stuff we can provide our services and our time and to do it, but I think that's the way forward is to not create another tool. Uh, for us, it's to actually open source. It's, it's not yet open source, but I think it's very very useful for everybody to like just see how we solve some issues and to just learn from each other and eventually have a good discussion about the whole the long term uh, path forward. Because I don't think that I don't think all the tools will be gone into one tool in like next two years or something, three years even. It, it won't be possible, and that, that's not possible. So, and that for for a speci uh, specific, it's the documentation. It lacks documentation. There are known bugs and features that are not documented and that's, this, yeah, that's some of the issues also people struggle with is to, to know, know how to use uh, specific things. Uh, yeah, for the rest it's more not trying to reinvent the wheel, I guess, and to, to really uh, really get support for other platforms or the other way around to, to get into more involved into other tools. Um, for Coxal, as I mentioned earlier, there is a built-in web IDE uh, which will be released in the next release as uh, Visual Studio, which is also terminal integrated and Xdebug. Um, then it is planned to combine the sandboxing feature and this uh, web IDE in order to have an integrated on-demand cloud-based development environment. And yeah, which can be used for sprints or trainings or data development needs. So you don't need to set up a development environment. And it is planned to refine some of the core Doxal images to be production hosting ready, and also to have deployments to Kubernetes cluster of sandboxing environments. Yeah. So DDEV's roadmap is public out there. You can just Google DDEV roadmap. Um, and you'll find it. But the you know, some of the biggest things that we have on the list are support, explicit support. DDEV already works with almost any PHP or JavaScript or HTML environment, but uh, we want explicit support for Magento. We want explicit uh, support for a number of other CMSs, and uh, we're, we're getting toward that, and our WordPress support has been lagging. But WordPress people are starting to use it more, and so we have to catch up on that. So that's that's probably the biggest things that we have on the roadmap. There's anyway, it's all there waiting for you to look at. For Lando, same thing. You can uh, actually uh, search for the Lando roadmap as well. Uh, they're trying to get a stable release of uh, version 3.0 out the door by January 1st. Um, they also want to work with more integrations of. Uh, I talked about the customization or the integration with Pantheon earlier. They want to do more of that with Aquia, with uh, um, uh, and other ones as well. Trying to get that in there. Um, but one thing I got to warn you at the bottom of this link, they talk about a marketing uh, mascot, and uh, uh, they click. Don't click that link. It's uh, not what you think it is. So that's it. Oh, there's one thing. Uh, somebody uh, had a Twitter question about WSL two, 
And I just wanted to say it is awesome. So if you work on Windows, uh, WSL is a Linux environment built into uh, Windows. And the new version that's coming next year, currently it's only an insider build, but it's called WSL2. It makes Windows be a great Linux machine. And the Docker technical <laughs> preview um, is headed in that direction. So um, the Docker Edge on Windows has a specific WSL2 version built into it. And we want to support that exclusively because it is a beautiful thing. Well, it'll be beautiful when it stabilizes. But it's beautiful to use when it's working right now. It's just great. So. OK, uh, actually, I was going to put that exact question, <laughs> but that's, that's fine. OK, so, so the, cat, the question was coming from the audience, and I think we, had, we still have time for one more question or two, is um, WSL solution for performance issues on Windows, in your case, maybe <coughs> interesting to respond? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely very interesting to see how Microsoft pushes the whole Linux on, on the desktop. I mean, that's really cool. And um, the problem, again, on my side is that my users cannot actually use it or install it because they don't have permission they to use it. They can't get Docker installed. Yes, correct. Yes. Yeah. They, they cannot install anything. Like, they, they <laughs> double click an installer and it says, no. Not even that? No, it's, no, like, it's, not in, like it's not enabled as a feature yeah. in their mind. Only windows. admins can install for yeah. a lot of Windows yeah. Yeah. for, yeah. for government sites, yeah. so you <coughs> won't have that option. So it's great. Like I'm, I'm not saying we're not going to use it. And I think, yes, that uh, the, the direction that Windows goes to support Bash and all the other um, Linux stuff is, is really cool. And um, it's also crazy that we, that we do that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's it's still you need to have permission to actually use it. You know, in WSL and WSL two, you could do stuff. Sorry, you could do stuff in the container that you might not be able to do on Windows. You might be able to install yeah. Docker in the Windows container. That's not the same as the Docker mm -hmm. that's the tech mm -hmm. preview, but it might solve your problem. Well, actually, you still need the WSL role to be enabled to feature. So oh, yes. you still have that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. but it will be, I agree, it will be a good entry point because yeah. if you just get that checkbox checked after that, <laughs> you can run Elasticsearch Solar or whatever you want to run because then, yes. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, it's going to be an exciting time what's going to happen with Windows and, this, and the support of WSL. I mean, there's. There's more and more that's coming, and um, yeah, suddenly maybe we'll all switch to Windows and develop there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we still have three minutes. I think one last question, and then the last question is, which of the dev tools is supporting local SSL certificates? Launch by this. So yeah, it's, uh, there is a, um, a traffic container in front of it. So traffic is a uh, reverse proxy. No, it's more than that, but it's used to as a load loading and reverse proxying to route all the traffic. It's actually a traffic router. And we do the SSL load loading there. So there is, you can test everything with, with, uh, with SSL, no problem at all. With a trusted server? <coughs> it's with a trusted server. It's generated. Make sir? You're using make sir? Yeah, we're using make sir. It's, uh, it's generated when installing. So it generates a local, only locally accepted cert. So it's no security issue. It's only on your local machine that you trust a specific cert, only uh -huh. used for a, for a launchpad itself. And I guess, yeah, that's actually the same for everybody using MCERT. DDEV does. DDEV uses MakeCert, and by default, you have trusted SSL, which is really nice. So you, you yeah, same, same with Lando, and you can actually uh, create a custom TLD uh, for yourself if you want to use, don't want to use the dot .lando dot .site that, that's on there all the time. You can create your own TLD and then generate a cert for yourself, and then it's a trusted cert as well. Okay, everyone, this was great. Um, we have very to have important, good, uh, very important, I believe. Okay, so but uh, but story. people on Twitter didn't get their question answered, so I think you can get. We their will attention. happily stay around okay. and answer yes. any yes. questions. Yes, <laughs> but the session is terminated now because it's terminated. It's, yes, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you are you are able to stay and, and make more questions to them. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.